folks are in and we're live. Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. We'll get started in just a minute. We're letting people get in the meeting here. Um, just so you know, the meeting is going to be recorded. So if you don't want to appear on screen, we ask that you turn off your camera. Um, you will be muted for the programming, but if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the chat and uh, our speaker will get to those at the end of the presentation. Um, so just again, for the people who got here late, we will be recording this and you will be muted for the duration of the meeting, but um, you can put questions for the, um, the speaker in the chat. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Helen Dulac with the City of Dallas Environmental Quality Service. And she's gonna give a little brief uh, introduction into what her department does. And then we'll get uh, to our wonderful speaker and all about um, all about the birds. So <laughs> we'll turn it over to Helen. Thank you so much, Vanessa. And I'm really excited that the sun is shining, the snow has melted, and we made it through. And so this is gonna be a great session. You might have lost a few things in your garden. Well, now today you have an opportunity to learn about some other things you can incorporate into your backyard, your gardening, or anything like or something like that. So it's gonna be great. I'm going to do a brief introduction and I'm gonna introduce our fabulous speaker. My name is Helen Dulac and I am with the City of Dallas and Office of Environmental Quality and Sustainability. And I cannot express my gratitude to be partnering with the Dallas Public Library on this series called Grow With Us. So I just wanna give you a little background about my department because you've probably never heard of us before. We were actually formed back in 2004 and back then we were called the Office of Environmental Quality. We worked really hard for four years to help Dallas become the first city in the United States to achieve a special environmental certification. This is an international certification that a lot of corporations and businesses do, but also municipalities. And the fact that Dallas was the first to do this is quite remarkable because it wasn't a city in California. It wasn't a city in Colorado. It, it was Dallas. So Dallas does uh, work hard to try to be green and we just want to go greener. So let's fast forward 10 years to 2018 where a lot of changes happened to this department. There was a restructuring in the city and OEQ absorbed some other environmental operations and programs and we doubled in size. And to reflect that change, we changed our name. And that's when we became Dallas Environmental Quality and Sustainability. With that restructuring, we had a combined outreach and engagement team that includes water conservation, zero waste, storm water, and some other things. And I am a proud member of that team. And we are just looking forward to doing more presentations like this. Um, the following year in 2019, Mayor Johnson created an Environment and Sustainability Committee. Those meetings are live streamed the first Monday of every month starting at 9 a.m. They are great to attend to keep, a tr to keep track of the environmental pulse of the city. You get to learn about all sorts of different programs, pilots, and, and um, updates to our climate plan, which was passed on May 27th of 2020. And so if you have heard of my department, it's probably from that. The CCAP plan is our roadmap for the next 30 years, how we're gonna to continue to improve the quality of life, to continue to provide services and mitigate climate change. And even things like today's program is a part of the CCAP plan. And something else that's pretty remarkable about this plan is that we're one of the few inland cities in the United States that has a, a climate plan. We do uh, support climate uh, mitigation and we are aware of it. And we are also part of the Mayor's Climate uh, Challenge Group. So I mentioned there was a restructuring in my department a couple years ago. Those groups you see in green are what joined us in 2018. I'm gonna talk about one of those just briefly and that is storm water. So storm water is anytime water, including snow melt, leaves your property. It could flow across your grass, down your driveway, goes into the street, goes down the gutter, all the way to that big drain at the end of the street. That big drain is called a storm drain inlet and it's there for one reason, it is to remove water so the streets don't flood. Now it does such a good job of that, that that water is connected directly into a creek or a stream, then into one of our lakes or the Trinity River. Nowhere in that system is that water clean. So if it picks up any pollution along the way, whether it's um, oil that dripped out of a car that was on your driveway, any sort of uh, excess lawn chemicals you might've used on your landscape, or even bacteria that was in pet waste that didn't get picked up before rain, or from lawn sprinklers, or from snow melt, like I said, or even from a hose left right. That's a lot of how a lot of pollution ends up in our lakes and the Trinity River, especially litter. So please just be mindful about what you're doing outside because pollution doesn't stay in your neighborhood. It actually can make it all the way to the Gulf of Mexico because the Trinity River does connect all the way to the Gulf of Mexico 500 miles away. 
So I mentioned the outreach and engagement team that I'm a proud, proud member of. We want to empower Dallas to save the earth. And we do that by virtual presentations like today and in person when we're allowed. We actually can present for free to your group, whether it's an HOA, a uh, school group. We have lots of materials from students from K to college. And we also can participate in seminars, activities, and events. We also host some of our own events, such as the Waterwise Landscape Tour. Uh, that was virtual this year. You can go to savedallaswater.com to see a virtual tour of houses that have zero grass, zero turf homes. Imagine how much time you can save by not having to cut that and how much water you save. Also coming up, we have some really cool events such as the Climate Change Symposium and also Fix a Leak Week. If you do invite us to speak at your next uh, virtual gathering, what do we talk about? Well, we can talk about environmental topics from A to Z, all the way from air quality to zero waste. So with that, I invite you to go to our website, greendallas.net, fill out the event request form if you'd like to invite us, or just browse. There's lots of information on that website. And if you ever need to reach me or any of my coworkers, please just send an email to greendallas at dallascityhall.com and someone will get back to you. And of course, follow us on social media. We are Green Dallas TX on Facebook and we are at Green Dallas on Twitter and Instagram. And with that, I, I am going to introduce our speaker today. I'm really excited for today's presentation. All right. All right, so Ryan owns and operates G Bar Naturals, an educationally centered homestead project located in East Dallas. From there, he offers a variety of homegrown products and learning opportunities, as well as performing bee-friendly removals of honeybees and bumblebees as the Honey Bee Relocation Service. Ryan is also the president of the Trinity Valley Beekeepers Association, a Texas master beekeeper, and has taught classes on bees at several area colleges. He participated in Mas Texas Master Naturalist Training in 2018, and he was raised in a ranching family and is finding a way to balance his agricultural roots uh, with claiming Dallas as home has been a lifelong pursuit. So we're really excited to have Ryan here today with us. Wonderful, thank you so much, Helen. I appreciate that. I'm excited to be here today. Um, this is officially the first time I have ever given a presentation on anything other than bees and bee related topics. Um, so thank you all for being here and bearing with me as we do this today. Uh, I'm excited to be talking birds today. I've learned over the last few days that you don't tell people that you now talk about the birds and the bees or they get the wrong idea. Um, but today we're not gonna be talking about bees. We're gonna be talking about birds. Um, I've put together probably entirely too much information to go into an hour long presentation. So I'm gonna kind of whip through it. And with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. If you do have questions typed into the chat, uh, specify which bird we're talking about as you ask the question, if that's uh, necessary and applicable. So starting with reasons to keep birds, uh, a lot of these are, oops, a lot of these are probably fairly self-evident, but uh, egg production is probably a dominating reason for people in backyard urban setting. Meat production, probably much less so. Um, education, I think, is a very important part, especially for families that are heading into stuff like this, um, but also just pets slash entertainment. Um, I can sit in the yard for hours watching the birds run around in circles and somehow find myself anything but bored. Um, we're talking about alternatives to chickens today, but of course, in order to talk about alternatives to chickens, we're going to start by talking about chickens just a little bit to lay the groundwork. Uh, if you have chickens or have seen recent presentations on them, I apologize for any redundancy. We're going to go through these first few slides extra quick. Um, introduction to chicken concepts, uh, starting with housing. Uh, a lot of people get confused about coop versus run and how they overlap and are and aren't the same thing. Um, I, I would simplify this at its very basic, uh, basic point to just say the coop is the bedroom for our birds, essentially. Uh, it provides roosting space, nesting space, shelter from the elements, security from predators, um, but it's definitely not designed to be the sole accommodation for our birds. Uh, I have to admit that our chickens largely don't use their run, but that's because we free range them almost every day. We're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail as we go through this. 
Um, but the coop is not designed to be everything your chickens need. It could be inside of your run or next to your run, as we're going to see in a minute. Uh, most people would say don't put food and water in the coop. It just gets too messy and attracts problems. Uh, I tried to put a ballpark number, but of course that's a ridiculously wide ballpark number there at the bottom bullet point. Um, it has everything to do with what you want to spend, what you're expecting, and the scale of what you're heading into doing. Uh, personally, I built our coop and run out of largely repurposed materials that were uh, almost free other than the wire mesh. Uh, but that said, if I put an hourly rate on my time, it definitely it exceeded those numbers significantly trying to repurpose things. Um, the run, if the coop is our bedroom, then the run is essentially the living space, the living room. Uh, it provides ample room for your birds when they're not able to be free ranging on a wider scale or if you're not ever able to free range them on a wider scale. Uh, it definitely is a spot we can put food and water in for our birds. And it's usually much more open air than our coop tends to be. Sometimes as simple as a chain link dog kennel style fence, that's probably the low end number there. Um, sometimes much more elaborate and much more expansive. Uh, these little mock-ups are actually mock-ups of our coop and run, and there you can see them side by side attached to each other and allowing birds to move back and forth between them. Um, our coop is elevated. We are in a floodplain. I especially appreciate Helen's mention of stormwater management in that sense. Uh, we are on a creek that is storm drain fed creek. Uh, so what goes down the storm drain ends up swimming with our ducks. Um, we actually expanded quite significantly on our bird operation this year. So we have a small pigeon loft attached to the other end of our run as well and lots of shared space going on. Um, we are lucky enough to be on several acres of floodplain here in the city. Um, but I want to specify early on that there's no reason this has to be that kind of scale project. This can easily be scaled down to a backyard. Um, and even with our flock uh, fairly expansive at about 60 chickens, 40 ducks, 20 something pigeons, um, and several cages of quail, this whole thing in terms of their living accommodations when they aren't free ranging can essentially fit in a space that's about 25 by eight foot all packed in there together and spreading out when they get out for the day. Um, that's what it looks like all combined into itself. Um, and again, we're up on stilts, but there's no reason it would have to be. You could easily put those all the way to ground level if you're not in a potential flood area. Um, and if you don't want to try and accommodate your livestock guardian dogs under your pigeon loft like we have on this end. Uh, we do have two livestock guardian dogs trained to guard our birds while they are free ranging around the yard space. Um, I've said free ranging several times already without explaining specifically what I'm talking about. Um, traditional definition of free ranging historically may have very well meant your livestock is not fenced and it's going where it pleases. Uh, most modern definitions are nowhere close to that kind of expectation. Uh, my understanding is commercial definition of free range says about two square feet for bird, um, which is quite packed and in my mind not really free ranging at all. Uh, backyard definition essentially means they're running around inside your fenced area. We're definitely not advocating for letting your birds get out in the streets into your neighbor's property, create issues for the people around you. Uh, there's definitely pros and cons to free ranging, uh, both in terms of your bird's diet and also in terms of predator issues or potential predator issues. Uh, we are going to talk through those in more detail as we proceed into this. We're gonna start by talking about a few breeds of chickens, not specifically, but categorically, because we're then gonna draw comparisons to them as we move forwards in the presentation. Uh, heritage breeds are essentially breeds that have been around for a while. Uh, they lean towards being dual purpose, meaning they were potentially good for meat production as well as good for egg production. Um, they're good sustainable backyard birds and generally I would advocate for thinking this kind of direction as you think about what kind of animals you want, unless you really do have a very targeted purpose outside of eggs and meat. Um, of course, some people are not looking for productivity at all and having birds around the household. Uh, that's where bantams and pet breeds come in in the chicken world. Bantams are simply smaller chickens. 
Um, some of them going as small as this Sarama that you see here sitting in somebody's hand, being essentially the smallest of the available chicken breeds. Um, and in some ways, much more of a pet, not necessarily well adapted to a free ranging and outside life in the more extreme conditions. Um, silkies, the one you see sort of in the backdrop here in the center of this grouping, are a very popular sort of pet breed, um, very personable, easy to see as fluffy and almost furry like we're used to thinking of with pets. Uh, that last one in the back right there is a frizzled Polish and they're also um, quite a personality to them. Lots of good options there. Commercial layers, and I, I grabbed a shot for one here, but I'm certainly not trying to pick on anybody in particular. I generally think of these as less suited for a backyard environment. Uh, they're bred for egg size, for laying power, for feed efficiency, but not necessarily bred to be cute and not necessarily bred for longevity either. They uh, tend to be sort of on, on until they're gone kind of mentality and approach to their lifestyle. Um, lots of good productivity, but if you're gonna get attached to somebody and miss it when it's gone, th these may not be the ideal breeds for you. Of course, we also have meat birds and similar to commercial layers, they're bred for very specific purposes. They're bred for size, a very extremely fast growth rate, uh, feed efficiency as well. They're not bred for laying longevity, they're not even reproducible in a backyard flock in most cases because they are specific crosses. They're not a breed that breeds true if you were to try and get them to reproduce with each other. In fact, some of them have their ability to reproduce so hampered by extreme growth rate and size that they can't actually reproduce with each other within that specific breed. Um, Cornish crosses are top of the list for names in terms of these, but there's been some uh, some additional options come to market in recent years. If you're looking for pets, layers, etc., you definitely would like to steer clear of a lot of the ones that are specifically bred for meat production. Barnyard mix is something we're going to use as a reference point as we talk about other birds. And essentially, whether this is from a barnyard or a backyard makes no difference at all. All we're saying is these are mystery box chickens. They're not a specific breed. They're likely to be somewhat unknown genetics. And essentially, they're just guaranteed to be a chicken. And that's about all we're really promising with barnyard mix chickens. Uh, barnyard mix can potentially apply to our other birds as well. Eggers um, have become increasingly common and are popular in recent years. Easter eggers and olive eggers, probably top of the list. I've seen some of these other terms bounced around as well. These are essentially barnyard mix, arguably, except they have been specifically selected genetics just not for any certain breed, they've been selected for egg colors, egg production, um, egg qualities, with everything else that you might be selecting for otherwise largely disregarded. Um, which leads us, of course, to talking about eggs. And although we do uh, have chicken eggs in the picture here, we also have a bowl that has chicken eggs, duck eggs, and quail eggs in it. Uh, the darker yolks are the duck eggs, the lighter, larger yolks are the chicken eggs, and of course the little ones are the quail eggs. And that's all ready to go in the skillet and make scrambled eggs one morning. I love a mix for a good skillet full of scrambled eggs. Um, generally, we could say chickens lay 150 to 320 eggs a year. A lot of variables there, mainly centered around what breed are we talking about. Um, layer breeds are going to lay a lot more, pet breeds are going to lay a lot less. Um, chickens provide the ultimate in color variation. We're going to talk about some of these other species and color variants in eggs, but they're not going to offer nearly the diversity that chickens do in that regard. Um, also, chickens lay really well in nest boxes. Even if they're free ranging, they'll return to the nest boxes to lay. And we're going to talk about how that may not be the case for some of these other birds. Um, food concepts, organic, non-soy, non-GMO, these are all concepts we're largely familiar with. If we're not, it's because we don't have an opinion about it and it's not really gonna matter to you as the keeper of these birds. Uh, peanut free is worth mentioning because a lot of poultry feed does rely on peanuts for protein content. If you are strongly allergic to peanuts, it's worth steering clear of that for the sake of your own safety, uh, not because you have any concerns for your birds. Um, calcium supplements are worth considering, especially if your birds are contained all the time and not able to find natural sources of any of these things. Starter, grower, layer feed, 
I always want to clarify that these are growth stages for your birds, starter for young chicks, grower for growing but um, older than chick age birds, and layer for mature reproductive birds. But these are not defining these stages for your birds. If you feed starter all the way to laying age, your birds are still going to grow and they're still going to lay. Um, and in fact, we do feed largely starter and grower to our flock because we always have a mix of ages in our flock. Um, scratch, you'll see marketed for poultry feed as well. I would essentially say this is dessert. Um, if you feel like you're about to be overfeeding your birds and they're still begging you for something, I'd definitely look into scratch. Um, but I tend to not feed much scratch out. Um, grit is also something that I tend not to feed to our birds simply because almost all of our birds um, are able to get what they need out of the yard in this regard. Grit is just an abrasive something that can be used to help their digestive system digest what they're eating. Reproduction, I'll make some references to broodiness through this presentation. Um, broodiness is just a tendency to want to hatch eggs. It's an instinctive drive for birds. Um, varies dramatically, some breeds are known for it. Silkies, for example, in the chicken world are known for going broody pretty readily. Um, but a broody hen will definitely accept eggs that are not her own. I've even had one silky who had not started laying yet go broody for me. Um, and absent a broody hen, you can always go with an incubator as an option for that. But um, we're not going to talk too much about that today, even though we do a lot of that. That's essentially another presentation. Sex ratio is worth talking about. Uh, of course, this may be irrelevant for you because many cities don't allow roosters or allow them in very limited circumstances. Uh, if you're not allowed to have a rooster where you live, you should definitely reconsider your tendency to want to have one. Um, but assuming that you think you're able to have a rooster in a flock, about a 1 to 10 ratio is probably pretty feasible for a backyard flock. Uh, 1 to 5 is common in breeder specific pens and operations. 1 to anything is completely feasible if you're not worried about fertility and maybe you have a rooster for their protective benefits. They're really good lookouts and guards for a flock. Um, and if you are in a backyard where you're not allowed to have a rooster, don't worry, a zero to anything ratio is totally feasible as well. You'll just have unfertilized eggs. You won't be able to reproduce chickens from those eggs. Predator issues, lots of different predators we could worry about even in the city. Um, we're gonna talk about these in specific detail as they apply to our other species today. Uh, for the chicken concept section, we'll just admit they're all out there somewhere. I will have to say we do see raccoons, possums, coyotes, bobcats, and foxes on our floodplain property, even being in East Dallas. Um, extreme Texas weather, and I have to admit I added this slide after our cold weather the last couple days. Um, and I would have to say we did almost nothing different with our adult birds for the cold spell we had. We added a little bit of weatherproofing on the outside of the coop and the run, and I'll get to that a little bit later in the presentation. But essentially, extreme cold and extreme heat need the same things for our birds. They need a good supply of food. They need water. In the heat, it's water to keep them cool. In the cold, it's water to aid their digestion because they need more feed to stay warm. Um, and of course, shelter is important in both cases as well in the heat for the shade value and in the cold for the shelter from cold drafts and from moisture that would have made the cold potentially deadly to them. Um, our coop and run stayed about three degrees warmer than the outside temperature through this cold spell we just had, and we had zero losses in our coop and run during this cold spell. Culling as a concept uh, traditionally means killing, harvesting your birds. But in a backyard context, I would encourage us to think of it as anything that removes a bird from your flock. Uh, if you are thinking about dispatching birds, definitely consider what code and zoning requirements uh, may have an impact on that decision. And rehoming is often an option if you're not interested in going that route or not able to go that route. Um, but keep in mind, culling is an unavoidable part of hatching. We're going to be talking about sex ratios today. If you hatch eggs or if you buy straight run birds, which is to say unsexed chicks, um, a one to one ratio is what you're likely to end up with and is not workable for most flocks. Couple little interesting facts. Um, we're gonna do some little trivia facts here and then at the end of the presentation for a little bit of extra um, trivia, entertainment, cute value. Uh, if we have time, I'm gonna be pulling in a little bottle baby pigeon that we're raising right now and trying to feed him on camera as well. 
Um, but this is just sort of stuff that won't really impact your management, but is interesting to realize. Uh, for chickens, I chose the fact that, and some of these facts are true for more than just the species I assigned them to, um, but chickens roost at night. And I go out there at night and I shine a light on them on their roost poles and see them kind of looking at me and stay in balance nice and still on the lookout for predators. And they're able to do that because they rest one half of their brain at a time. They don't really sleep their entire brain in true sleep like humans and mammals tend to. Uh, this is somewhat true of prey animals in general, but especially true of birds. Ducks, I chose their ability to stand on something cold without losing body temperature. Um, their arteries and their veins kind of wind and tangle and go side by side as they go through their legs, which means that temperature exchange, heat exchange takes place in their body, in their legs, rather than down on the snow and ice, which means my ducks were able to run around on the ice wondering why it wasn't water, um, without getting cold in their body temperature by doing so. The heat exchange is contained in their legs. Cold feet have less temperature exchange going on than warm feet would when they're in contact with the ice. For quail, I chose this moment to explain that we're only talking about Coternix quail or domestic quail today. Uh, bobwhite quail may be familiar to a lot of people in Texas because we have them here. Uh, my interesting fact here is that these birds are not very closely related actually, although we call them both quail if we look at family there, um, perhaps more closely related to our Coternix domestic quail over here on the right is a different species, which turns out to actually be chickens uh, are more closely related in terms of this structure of relationships uh, than our North American quail are to these domestic quail. So that's all we're going to be talking about moving forwards today when we say quail is Coternix quail. Uh, pigeons, I chose an interesting fact that they are um, co-parenting birds. Uh, they do feed their young when they're hatched. A young pigeon can't run around and get its own food like chickens, ducks, and quail can. Um, and not only do they feed, care for their young, incubate their young, but both males and females contribute to this process, um, alternating who's on the nest and who's doing what task as they need to go get water and food for themselves. Uh, that is why we need to bottle feed our little orphan baby pigeon that we're hoping to get to at the end today. So jumping into ducks, um, we're going to talk about two categories of ducks today, essentially. They're mallard-derived breeds, and then there are Muscovy ducks. Um, lots of different breeds of mallard-derived ducks. Um, all have mallards as an ancestor, but have been extensively selected for various things. Uh, sometimes real purposeful things, sometimes like this white crested one on the second row, um, bred for having a cotton ball on its head, essentially. Uh, it's an appearance thing. Um, you may be looking for specific purposes or you may be looking for which of these photos is attractive to you. Um, keep in mind, meat ducks or heavier bodied ducks are less capable of flight than some of the smaller bodied ducks. That may be a good or a bad thing for you, depending on the environment you're going to try and raise them in. And of course, barnyard mixed ducks exist as well, just like we talked about with chickens. Uh, we're not going to go into too much detail there. Essentially, they're just guaranteed to be ducks, right? Muscovy ducks are our other category of duck we're going to talk about. They are very flight capable ducks. And if you doubt that, here's a photo of two of our Muscovies perched on the roof of our house down here on the bottom left. Um, they are dual purpose or perhaps more meat inclined ducks if you're looking for a purpose there. One advantage to raising them in the city is they're very quiet. They are not loud quack, 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 like the mallard breeds tend to be. Um, and that is the females that make that sound. We'll talk a little bit more about that on the sex ratio page. Uh, I jokingly describe Muscovy ducklings as teddy bears with razor blades uh, because they are very sweet. They're very friendly. They're very um, unintimidated by humans comparatively, but they definitely have more claws than the other breeds do. Um, arguably more closely related to geese than to ducks, but we do call them Muscovy ducks. Duck housing, essentially a coop and a run works. In this case, we're looking at a coop that goes all the way to the ground. Ducks don't do well going up a steep ramp into a coop. They don't use our chicken coop. Our ducks live on the floor of our run at night when they come in for the evening. Uh, they don't use laying boxes the same way chickens do. Essentially containing them during their prime laying hours is how you get your duck eggs. 
if your ducks are running around 24 hours a day, they're not going to come lay eggs where you want them to. You're going to be picking them off the edge of the water source or even out of the water in some cases, unfortunately. Um, when I say prime laying hours, I essentially mean sunrise. I can let our ducks out by 7 a.m. and still have gotten the majority of the eggs they're going to lay already laid for that day. Um, you can get a nest box off the edge of a run for ducks. I do have one that goes on the back side of our run so as not to conflict with everything else. They don't need this in any way, but if they do use it, and that is an if, if they do use it, it does help keep the eggs a little bit cleaner than the dirt floor in our run would have. Um, cleanliness of eggs is much more of a factor with ducks than with chickens. Uh, I did winterize our run for our ducks staying there at night by putting an additional panel that sheltered them from the snow and the draftiness during this cold spell. Egg production, about the same as chickens potentially. Uh, some duck breeds are very productive. Khaki Campbells and uh, the hybrid Golden Layer 300s are probably top of the list for egg numbers. Um, the eggs are larger on average than chicken eggs, very limited color variety. Um, our runner ducks lay this sort of light blue green that we see up in the top right. Most ducks lay a sort of cream to white egg and Cayugas are a black duck that lays this dark egg, although by the end of the season they kind of run out of ink, so to speak, and tend to lay a lighter egg. Um, you see an example of a lighter Cayuga egg down here in the center at the bottom. Food and water, um, I put a lot of bullet points on this page and I almost regret it. It makes it seem complicated where it's not. Uh, there's commercially available duck feed. They are very good foragers if you had a good environment for them to do that in. Uh, given that our ducks do free range, I simply feed them chicken feed as adults and they pick up whatever else they need in their diet out of the creek. Um, I put custom mixes on here because when I'm feeding ducklings, I still don't buy specific duck feed. I already have quail feed and chicken feed in bins here. And I find that a midpoint between those two is just about perfect for a ducklings dietary requirements. So I feed ducklings half chicken and half game bird feed. We'll get to game bird feed when we talk about quail. Um, a lot of people say that their duck's favorite treat is frozen peas. Uh, I found that my duck's favorite treat is actually grapes. Um, but they are fun to feed treats to. They get all kinds of excited about stuff like that. Swimming space, uh, strictly speaking, ducks don't need to swim, but they sure do love to. Uh, if you're fortunate enough to have a natural water source, they will use and love that. Um, if you're not, there's no reason you can't still manage a couple ducks, but uh, you're looking at providing something like this little kitty pool. Um, certainly our ducklings love that, uh, perhaps because the creek has turtles in it, and we'll talk about that when we talk about predators. Uh, swimming water is fine for drinking water needs. There's all kinds of water options. They do need something they can dip their entire bill into. If they can't get up to their nostrils, and you can see in the kiddie pool picture where their nostrils are, they will run into respiratory issues from not being able to clean out their sinuses. So um, some of the waterers that require pecking that we use for other birds do not work for ducks. I mentioned water poisoning on here. If you're getting shipped ducklings, that's primarily when this comes into play. And I have had some issues with this. Ducks love water so much that if they're severely dehydrated, they will literally drink themselves to death when given an ample supply of water. If you worry that shipped ducklings or some other mishap has left you with ducks that are somewhat dehydrated, limiting their water intake until their enthusiasm for it has waned a little bit can be important. Ducks are messier than chickens. Um, they do have water needs that allow for more mud. Also, I'm going to admit that when we talk about duck mud, uh, we're not really just talking about mud. We're talking about everything else that comes with ducks as well. Um, so there is a little bit of a gross out factor there sometimes. Um, and they do tend to have an impact on a yard unless they have quite a bit of room per duck. Uh, they are filter feeders. In this picture of a bill, you can see how they don't really have teeth, but they do filter stuff through their bill there. Um, similar to how we think about, you know, whales, for example, as a weird example comparison uh, being filter feeders, which means they will get the ground wet, they will stick their bill in the mud, and they will turn it all around and shift it through their bill and find little things in it that they want to eat. Um, and that can have an impact on how your grass looks once they're done. Uh, flight concerns for free ranging. 
primarily Muscovies are the ones that I would worry could actually get out of a privacy fence if you've got a say person tall privacy fence around your yard. Um, mallards, of course, we all know they can fly if we've seen them in the wild. But most of the domestic breeds, even some of the smaller bodied ones like our khaki Campbells, are really not very flight capable. They can, they can fly going downhill, I'll give them that much. Uh, mixing with chickens and free ranging does sometimes carry some concerns and we're going to talk about that as we talk about sex ratios. Uh, and I want to clarify here, sex ratios as we talk about them here are really not recommendations. They are care requirements for these birds. Uh, they can get quite aggressive in their pursuit of females and in their competition with other males if we don't have the right balanced. In this case, more balanced, as I've used it on this slide, is a bad thing. We're looking for about one to five as a reasonable ratio for ducks. And this is where I was coming from, talking about culling not really being an option unless you're buying birds that have already been reliably sexed. Um, I have seen drakes try to drown each other competing for females. I have had females end up injured by drakes competing for grabbing them to mate with them. Um, I have even heard stories, although we've never had a, I suppose, an imbalance so severe that it led to this, of drakes trying to mate with female chickens, uh, which can be fatal for the hen uh, because ducks do have a penetration aspect to their mating and chickens do not. Chickens essentially have a kiss instead of a penetration uh, going on when they're mating. Uh, so hen chickens are not made to accommodate mating with a male duck. Um, and remember with any of these, a zero to whatever ratio is totally workable if you don't need fertilized eggs. Uh, the weird thing about sex ratios for ducks is that females are the loud ones in the duck world, just like males are the loud ones with the quail and the chickens that we're talking about. Broodiness, uh, I've never had one of our ducks go broody. Uh, possibly some of my cycling from the run to the free ranging is, has to do with that. Uh, Muscovies have a reputation for being great parents. Mallards are somewhat inclined to go broody. A lot of ducks are very disinclined to go broody or even will do it and then sort of abort partway through and leave you disappointed and feeling like your eggs died. It's weird to think about eggs dying, but it's definitely how it feels in that moment. Um, I raise almost all our ducklings in an incubator and just to emphasize how not related to our other ducks Muscovies are, I'll point out the difference in incubation time. Uh, mallard based breeds are a 28 day incubation, Muscovies are a 35 day incubation, closer to geese in some ways than they are to our ducks. Uh, they can mate with each other. In fact, our sex ratio page had a Muscovy mating with a Duclair, which is a Muscovy and a mallard based breed. Uh, they produce mule offspring, uh, have sort of an in-between point on incubation time and end up sterile. Mule ducks cannot reproduce, although they will lay eggs. Predation uh, involving ducks, we've already seen our long list of predators, but specific to duck concerns, um, they are really good at watching for aerial predators, but unlike chickens who watch out for the flock, ducks tend to watch out for themselves and not necessarily announce a threat to the other ducks around them. Uh, so they do still fall prey to aerial predators. We've lost more ducks to aerial predators than we have um, any of our other birds. Also with ducks, we sometimes run into snapping turtle issues. If you're looking at a natural water source, be aware of what your turtles may be like in there. Um, definitely more of a threat to young turtles, but in this case, we do see a very large snapping turtle attempting to pull an adult duck down into the water. Um, I had a couple injured feet when I first let our ducks start going into the creek from snapping turtles. Uh, never lost one to them to the best of my knowledge, although if I did, they'd simply disappear from the surface of the water and it would be hard to really see it. Um, ground predators apply as well, of course. That'll apply to anything you allow to free range. Uh, that top right photo is a picture of them watching for predators. I love watching them do that in the yard when it, there's not a predator. Uh, balloons floating by overhead, a plane going over the yard. They'll do that really concerned eye on the sky for little to no reason sometimes, and it's kind of comical. Uh, training your ducks, and I use the term training kind of loosely here, and our first three bullet points emphasize what I'm really saying, which is ducks are creatures of habit. 
We are training them with routine and not training them the way we train other pets. Um, starting from a young age can be very beneficial. Food motivation, water motivation, associating sounds and images with those things. Uh, some resources will even tell you to wear the same clothes every time you go see your ducks and they'll be more comfortable with you. Uh, that's a little extreme in my mind, but I do use the same, and I chose one for my drinking cup today for this reason. I do use the same blue cup every time I go feed and call my ducks and they come better to this blue cup than the red one that I get if the store is out of blue. Um, also from a very young age, every time I give food and water to my ducks, I use the same duck, 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 just kind of monotone duck repetition. And they come to associate that with a positive thing and eventually kind of come to it. Uh, that said, they'll come to it great at feeding time or at the end of the day when it's time to go home. But if I pick an atypical time to walk out in the yard and call my ducks, they will ignore me because I just broke all the rules of habits and routine. Um, herding ducks really isn't as hard as it sounds. You don't have to get every one in. You just have to get the majority of them in. Ducks don't like to be by themselves. If you have three ducks and you get two of them in, the other one will be panicking to get in there with them before long. Um, jumping into quail, again, a reminder that we have lots of North American species of quail, and I do actually keep a couple of these. We keep Gamble's quail and Bob White's, um, but we're talking today just about the domestic Coturnix quail. Um, they are productive egg layers. They're better in a group setting. They're much less likely to cause damage to each other in competition, um, although still somewhat prone to that, and we're going to get there. Uh, top two recommendations for this, if you're looking for any form of productivity, meat or eggs, would be the jumbo varieties. I say varieties for quail because there are no true breeds in Coturnix quail, um, just different gene pools of the same species. Jumbo browns and the A&M, there was originally an A&M project for this, but they abandoned it years ago and everybody still throws their name onto things. Um, jumbo browns and jumbo whites would be my recommendations if you're looking for meat production or egg production. The birds are a little bit bigger and the eggs are a little bit bigger. But there are lots of color varieties as we see down the side here. If you're looking for entertainment, pet value, etc., you may want to be able to tell them all apart from each other and you can mix all these colors together just fine. Uh, sometimes I feel like the white ones get bullied more than the others do if you put them in a mixed setting. I'm not sure why that is. Um, as we talk about eggs, we're also going to talk about celadon layers. Uh, celadon layer is just a different egg color gene, and we see two baskets demonstrating it, as well as a mixed basket over here on the right. The white to shades of blue is what we call celadon eggs in quail. Um, this gene pool does have some, I, what I think are inbreeding issues that come with um, some very heavy selection for this trait. Um, but generally, they're the same quail you're looking at either way. And if you want a good mixture to your eggs, it's worth trying to get a couple of both gene pools into your cage. Um, I should mention, I, I sort of skipped some of my bullet points here. About three to four quail eggs equals a chicken egg for most recipe usage. They have a great reputation for health, nutritional benefits. Um, there are the only two colors at play. And duck eggs, quail eggs, both have a great reputation for being a workaround for allergies. If you know somebody who has an allergy to chicken eggs, they may very well find they're not allergic to these other options. Housing for quail, we're gonna talk about outdoor options first. Um, of course, I popped up a picture of our run here. We don't use our run for quail, but it very well could be used for quail. Um, a pen, good dirt floor. You worry a little bit more about parasites if you're keeping quail on a dirt floor than on a wire floor. Uh, if you are keeping them on wire, you see our, an interior shot of one of our cages here on the left. Notice that is PVC coated wire on the floor. You'll run into issues with their feet if you don't use the PVC coated wire on the bottom of a cage. Um, but even a rabbit hutch type of, of cage works just fine for these. Um, if they're not outdoors, you're cleaning out trays, cleaning out feces on a regular basis, and they do kind of make a mess fast. Um, I would have to admit the quail feel like the most work and the least entertainment value of all the things we keep. Uh, indoor cages can work as well. Whether you're indoor or outdoor, you'll see my center bubble here is demonstrating a rollout tray. 
one of the things I love about caged quail for egg production is that you can keep them on wire and have a rollout effect going on. It makes collecting quail eggs clean and easily um, quite feasible compared to some of our other egg producers. Uh, it's remarkable just how um, small a cage can be a totally healthy environment for quail. I really dislike the idea of keeping chickens in battery type cages, battery being the commercial arrangement, kind of like what we see one of down here on the bottom. Uh, but quail, the Coternix domestic quail, really do thrive in that kind of cage. Um, you don't want them stepping on top of each other or anything, but a small cage like that could be totally feasible for maybe five birds with one male in there. Now, if you're not going for productivity, essentially, um, even a little bird cage like we see on the bottom right could work just fine. Only thing I would mention there is you don't want the long slatted wire floor like tends to come in that kind of cage. If I were using that cage, I would take that floor out and either put in a one inch by half inch PVC coated floor or just put in shavings and let them run around on the plastic bottom. Um, only other mention on indoor housing of quail, they are dirty, they are dusty. Um, I would put them in their own dedicated space, perhaps the garage. I would not look at putting them in the kitchen and trying to keep my utensils clean. Um, predation concerns with quail, uh, cages everything. Quail do not free range. If you let them out, they will simply disappear, likely dead, but if not dead, they'll wander off. Um, so protection is in the cage. I admit I do use a one by one inch by two inch mesh like we see on the left down here at the bottom, even for my outdoor cages, but that is not predator proof. I am relying on our livestock guardian dogs to keep predators away from that cage at that point. If I wanted it to be predator proof against things like snakes and rats, I would want maybe a quarter inch mesh. Um, I put our dachshund on this shot um, somewhat jokingly, but um, don't ask me how I know that a dachshund will eat a quail if it gets out of a cage. <laughs> uh, dachshunds are not livestock guardian dogs. I'm talking about specific breeds when I say that. Uh, food and water for quail. Um, essentially anything that gets them food and water works just fine, but they do like to be messy. Um, your food options should be something that prevents food waste. Your water options should be something that prevents them from making too much of a mess. Any of the standard poultry options work just fine for these things. Even a water bowl was what I was using in some of our cages when the gravity systems froze when we had this recent freeze. Um, the quail did just fine in their outdoor cages, even with very little shelter from the elements, um, even through the extreme temperatures that we just had. Um, game bird feed is a higher protein content and otherwise very similar to what we feed um, to ducks, chickens, etc. In a pinch, when I'm out of game bird feed, I will feed my quail chicken feed for a moment. Um, but if you feed it too long, you'll run into protein deficiencies. Ducks and game birds do need both a higher protein level and some niacin content, which is what we get from the game bird feed when we're feeding, um, feeding game bird feed to ducks and quail, etc. cetera. Uh, I put drowning on here. That's only a concern for quail chicks. If you're trying to raise quail from shortly out of the egg, uh, you would think quail chicks are going out of their way to try to drown themselves. Um, if I were using this poultry waterer that's uh, just next to my game bird feed here, I would fill it with gravel so that they literally cannot drown themselves in it, even if they were trying to. I'm sure they're not trying to, but raise some quail chicks and you will be convinced that they want that. You really will. Uh, for the cages, I really like an external feeder like you see down here in blue. It doesn't have to be blue, mine or white, um, but I love having water and food that I can maintain from outside the cage. If you're collecting eggs from a rollout, try feeding and watering from outside the cage. You don't have to worry about them trying to fly out while you're trying to reach in. Sex ratios, again, these are not suggestions or recommendations. These are what these birds need not to hurt each other. Uh, one to four, I did some reading on some actual studies on this. One to four is the best fertility rate. And one to 12 was shown in studies to be higher egg productivity and faster growth rates. Uh, if you're not looking for fertility in your eggs, definitely don't go smaller than a one to 12 ratio. A zero to whatever ratio is always feasible for these things. I am going for some fertility in my quail eggs. So I tend to end up about one to six. 
Now I did put a mature warning here. I'm going to splash up on screen just for a second to emphasize um, quail are vicious with each other if you let these ratios get anything close to balanced. Uh, if blood concerns you look away for a second and I won't leave this up too long, but here we go. Um, male quail will definitely scalp each other all the way down to the skull competing for female quail. Um, so again, not a recommendation. This is what you need to do to keep your quail from hurting each other. I am gonna go ahead and go for a slightly less graphic photo here, although we're talking about eating our quail at this point. Again, if you're raising quail, you are going to end up with 50% male. Um, our solution for that is to acknowledge that the males are delicious and um, hopefully that photo looks delicious to you. Um, if not, we're gonna go ahead and move on off this slide and you can look back at the screen now. Introduction to pigeons. Um, pigeons are kind of the oddball in this presentation in that they're not usually considered agriculture by most people. Uh, some people have a very negative impression of what pigeons are. Um, I wanna start by saying pigeons and doves are essentially the same species, very closely related. Um, if you have a negative impression of pigeons, it's probably because they tend to be scavenging at 7-Eleven, uh, whereas doves tend not to be. Keep in mind that if you're raising pigeons, they're not scavenging in the trash. They're feeding what you feed them. Hopefully that's a, a high quality food. Um, and hopefully that negates some of these negative impressions people sometimes have of pigeons. Uh, different varieties and breeds, uh, aside from doves, we have several different categories of pigeons. The ferals, of course, we talked about feral pigeons being essentially the equivalent of barnyard mix in the pigeon world. They are just whatever genetics they happen to end up with and whatever genetics happen to survive. Uh, you tend not to end up with the fancier pigeon genetics in the feral population, uh, simply because there's absolutely no survival value in this beautiful fluffy collar we see down here on the bottom right corner. Um, but it may very well enable you to see pigeons in a different light and like the idea of having them around to look at some of the fancy breeds. Also flying, sporting, racing pigeons. Uh, sometimes you hear homing pigeons being used as the term for this category. Um, all kinds of fun can be had there. If you see up in the top right, we have a pigeon that looks like I accidentally pasted it in upside down. Um, I didn't, that was trying to demonstrate that rolling and tumbling pigeons are a thing in the flying category. Um, and they do actually do some aerial acrobatics. That's trying to show you um, it was not an error on pasting it in upside down there. Uh, personally, I headed towards utility pigeons. Um, utility pigeons are essentially squab producing pigeons, uh, squab being pigeon meat. Uh, grand history of heritage breeds being used for this purpose and feral pigeons being used for this purpose. Back in Depression era, United States was probably when they were at their peak. Um, there were some definite efforts after that era to raise breeds of pigeons that would be viable for commercial meat production. Uh, never really caught on, but the breeds stick around. And what drew me to them was kind of the heritage breed aspect, the almost outdatedness of them, to be quite honest. Um, I have not eaten any of my pigeons and don't necessarily plan to, um, but I love the larger bodied pigeons. And this sketch we see here in the center demonstrating how large this pigeon is compared to what we might think of uh, uh, finding at the gas station sort of demonstrates that. Some of the larger pigeons that I keep are almost chicken sized rather than what you think of as the size of a pigeon. Um, and to demonstrate that here on the right, we do have some of my giant runt pigeons a uh, little bit of an ironic name there, but they are the size of a small chicken, um, one of the larger breeds of utility bred pigeons. Uh, we do see a father at the top and he is free ranging at that point. And then a mother with two offspring down here at the bottom. Um, free ranging, usually people don't use the term free ranging with pigeons. Instead, they just talk about flying their pigeons or not flying their pigeons, but hopefully you do have a loft that accommodates them flying, whether you let them out or not. Um, I usually choose to only let out one half of a pair when it comes to pigeons. Pigeons do mate for life. Uh, that said, if they lose a mate, they will pick another. Um, but if their mate is sitting there confined and they're out flying around the yard, they will most definitely come back to that mate. Uh, therefore, I let one half of a pair out at a time and feel completely confident there. 
Um, again, our little loft accommodation works just fine attached to a run to provide some flight space. Uh, I do have pigeon boxes in my run as well. And the pigeons use the ground during the day while the ducks are out in the creek. And by the time the ducks come home at night, the pigeons are roosting and they're not competing for ground space in there. A run would work just fine, given some shelves for nesting and a little bit of shelter from the elements. You don't necessarily have to have the elevated add-on there. You will see the pigeon gates there. Those are advantageous because you can let one out and then count on it to come home and push its way through and you're not leaving the door open for the other pigeons to come out. Um, you could even keep pigeons as indoor pets. Part of my original interest in pigeons did stem from having a pet dove that lived in a birdcage in the house once upon a time. Uh, because they do bond both to their parents and to the other, uh, to their partner, the other half of their pair, uh, they're fairly prone to bond to people in a way that these other birds may not. Um, they're not just appreciative of you because you bring them food. Uh, and keep in mind, if you are keeping just one dove or pigeon inside, they bond to you in a way that is somewhat non-optional social structure. They need some interaction. It can be human interaction, but if you leave them confined and forget to give it to them, you really are taking away one of the things they need. Um, indoor cages for pigeons, essentially bigger is better. Uh, you're working with the limitations of your living space. Egg squab, more pigeons. We're talking productivity from pigeons here. Um, egg production, essentially non-existent for all practical purposes. Less than 50 eggs per year, probably don't ever get close to that unless you're literally stealing their eggs when, you, when they lay them. Um, if you're looking for edible production from pigeons, you are talking about squab. Uh, very off-putting to a lot of people because squab is harvested from young pigeons that are just about to hit the age where they can leave the nest. About a month old, uh, the pigeon here in the photo is the first bottle baby pigeon that I ever raised. Uh, his name is Tiny and he is very bonded to us and has not yet managed to move out of the house. And by that, I mean, we have not yet managed to part with him that much. Um, we do have another bottle baby pigeon. If you didn't hear me say it at the beginning, I'm going to, after we get done with our presentation, whip out a bottle and a baby pigeon and show you guys how that's done. Uh, sort of a face only a mother could love with baby pigeons. They're um, hideous and adorable at the same time somehow. If you are not looking for edible productivity out of your pigeons, then you're looking at making pigeons. There is a market for pigeons, especially purebreds. If you start getting mixed breed pigeons, there's very little market for them. You're very likely to start wondering what on earth do I do with all these pigeons? Um, so I would highly encourage you to pick a breed or a couple breeds and really focus on keeping purebred offspring coming out of your pigeon loft. Food and water, um, pigeons do desperately need to bathe. So it's not just about giving them drinking water, it's about giving them water to bathe in. They'll dust bathe like chickens and quail will to some degree, um, but they definitely benefit from water to bathe in. That little tub up there at the top works great for this. They will also bathe until their water is disgustingly filthy and then drink the water and make themselves sick. So I definitely advocate giving them clean water, giving them access to water, and then not necessarily leaving it in there all the time. Uh, my pigeons have water twice a day for a limited window, and then they don't have water in there with them all the time. Um, pigeon feed, there's commercially available pellets. Uh, chicken feed works in a pinch. Uh, I say in a pinch, it's not like the quail where there's real deficiencies there. It's just not quite ideal. I do feed about 50% chicken feed to my pigeons all the time. Um, I also feed a lot of a seed mix that looks a lot like this one at the bottom. And I just put it in a dog bowl in the bottom of the run. You only wanna feed them what they can eat pretty readily. You don't want steady access food with pigeons. Otherwise they will eat the candy out of the mix and leave everything else there to spoil. Um, you want them to have to eat the whole mix. Sex ratio, a great thing about pigeons is that culling for sex ratio is not a thing. A one-to-one -one ratio is perfect. They partner up and call that mated for life. Very little fighting amongst pigeons, even if the ratio isn't balanced, they just won't be able to find partners for some of them. Very unlikely to harm themselves. The only instance I've ever had a pigeon hurt another pigeon was when I was trying to quarantine new arrivals in a dog crate for a minute to verify their health before I put them in our flock. 
And then we did see something um, lesser impact, but similar to what we saw with the quail, a tendency to kind of try to scalp each other. Um, but in a spacious environment, good living accommodations, it literally never happens. Predation, um, primarily we're talking about hawks, arguably cats. If you're keeping indoor pigeons, definitely your own pets can be a concern. But primarily we're talking about hawk impacts on your flying pigeons. Everything else is just about having a secure loft. Um, loft just being another pigeon, pigeon world term for a run or a coop. Now, as we wrap this up, I did want to just provide some comparison slides. Um, egg productivity, I tend to put quail slightly top of the list uh, just because of the ease of collecting eggs from a rollout tray. Also because breed specifics don't really come into play. We can essentially expect, expect 300 plus eggs from a quail hen in an annual cycle as long as we're providing artificial lighting in the winter time so that they don't see the changing daylight hours as a reason to slow down laying. With the chickens and the ducks, these variables are all about breed, although chickens will slow down a little bit in the wintertime as well. Pigeons, of course, not the choice for egg production. Meat production. Uh, I again tend to see quail as top of the list for this. Um, quail have a very short incubation time, only two weeks compared to three weeks for chicken and four weeks for ducks. That means I can produce twice as many quail in the same amount of time as I can produce ducks. Um, they're easily, easily harvested and quite delicious. They just may not be something a lot of people are familiar with. Chickens come in second. They have some enhanced growth rates in the meat birds. Uh, they're a good, good uh, feed conversion rate. I failed to mention quail actually come out the top on a scientific comparison of feed conversion rates here. Um, pigeons produce some meat, but most people wouldn't keep them for that reason. Now, in terms of pet value, uh, this is a very subjective little chart here. I did choose to put pigeons at the top of the list here, and you'll kind of see why if you get to see the bottle feeding here in a second. They do bond with you. Now, chickens and ducks will seem like they bond with you as well, but if I'm honest, I think if you stopped being the one that brought them food and water, you would stop seeing that bond relatively quickly. Um, whereas the pigeons really do seem to bond with you the way they bond with each other. Quail are way down at the bottom of the list here, in part because they tend to all look the same, in part because they're a little bit vicious with each other and therefore hard to love, um, and in part just because, although you could keep one or two in a cage and call them pets, they just don't have the tendency to interact with you like some of the other birds do. Lastly, education value, and um, I would tend to see education value, uh, the prime opportunity for education value at least, not only being where does your food come from, but being the reproductive aspects of some of these birds. It is fascinating to watch a little chick hatch or a little duckling hatch. Um, cuteness factor, I'd have to say ducklings always win. They are just adorably clumsy waddling little things. Um, the eggs being different sizes on these indicate how likely they are to go broody. And you'll notice pigeons are not very suited for incubation. I have done it, but then you end up with bottle babies. A bottle baby pigeon just out of the egg has to be fed every two to three hours for the first week or so. Uh, we're talking setting alarm clocks to get up in the middle of the night to feed that little baby pigeon that won't stop squeaking. Um, unless you want to get up in the middle of the night to do that, don't start incubating pigeon eggs. Um, and that does wrap up our presentation. Um, no doubt there's going to be some follow-up questions to this. We're going to try and take some of the ones from the chat. Um, but if we don't get to a question or one comes up later, you can always reach me by email at that Gmail address, or you can find our Operation GBAR Naturals on Facebook and Instagram at those two different tags there as well. Um, I do love opportunities to talk about these things. I would also love opportunities to talk about incubation, bees, or even the livestock guardian dogs that we've spent the last year training to work with poultry. Uh, they have a lot of instinct to work with livestock, but it's mostly four-legged livestock, and we end up doing some training to work with birds. At this point, I am going to go ahead and take some questions from the chat. And then for those who are able to stick around, we'll have an adorable and hideous little baby pigeon in here drinking out of a bottle in a second. All right, thank you so much, Ryan. So I think um, I'm definitely sticking around to see the bottle baby because uh, I've never seen one, so I'm so excited. And I had no idea that pigeons bonded to people. You're right that you know my 
view of pigeons is just what I've seen in the urban environment. And they, they you know, they're, you've heard them called, you know, like rats in the sky and different things like that. And, right. uh, and I had no idea that they had, they were such good pets. And I was also, uh, I guess I didn't realize that they made it for life and they weren't that aggressive. I mean, and also I guess I didn't realize that they were so smart because they always seem kind of, you know, just, you know, right. fumbling around and stuff like that. But all right, so we do yeah. have some and questions. In the street when they shouldn't be, things like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Okay, so can you please go over a little bit about the free ranging space requirements for the birds, please? Yes. Um, you know, when we're talking about space requirements, we're essentially talking about um, run space. I, I would say primarily think first about run space. Um, two square feet, the, the commercial industry likes to try and call free ranging. I would say that's feasible. I wouldn't call it free ranging, but it's perfectly feasible space for birds to be able to live a decent quality of life. Um, that's two square feet per bird. Um, Thinking of it that way, any backyard is likely to be a feasible setting for free ranging at least a small handful of hens. Um, you're likely to find your limit with your run space, not with your yard space is really what I'm getting at. Um, beyond that, I, I certainly wouldn't go to two square feet per bird measuring your backyard and saying how many birds can I have. Uh, we are on several acres by having <laughs> mostly ground that floods periodically. Um, so we do have quite a bit of space for them here. Uh, but like I said, we are maintaining 50 to 60 chickens as well as ducks and other things happening. Um, I would say the average setup for a backyard probably works to free range four or five hens quite feasibly. Um, two to three if you're more worried about what impact they may have on your landscaping. Uh, they will eat everything that's edible and scratch at the things that are not. So if you're worried about the appearance of your yard first and foremost, definitely start small and inch your way upwards. Uh, that being said, when I say start small, don't ever start with one. These are birds that like to function in a flock. I would always get at least two or three birds if I'm gonna do this at all. The only exception being an indoor pet pigeon or dove. Okay, well, that's a good question because I mean, that's a good answer because it leads into one of the questions is what's a good starter number for chickens? Yeah. And what is a good position for a coop such as in the sun or the shade? Okay, excellent question. Um, and your coop really is um, providing shade for your birds. So I wouldn't worry too much about sun or the shade. I chose to go for about half the day in the shade and about half the day in the sun. They get afternoon sun and morning shade. If I was picking the ideal place and um, other aspects of my yard didn't influence it, I'd probably go for morning sun and afternoon shade because we are in Texas. Uh, but regardless, your coop and your run should be well ventilated and providing shade. Therefore, it shouldn't be a major factor there. Um, as far as starter flock size, even with a fairly expansive floodplain situation, we started with 12 chickens and 12 ducks as our starting point. Um, two to three would be the more feasible starting point for the average backyard. All right, and what about placing your coop like near a fence or out in the open? Um, the only issues with placement in that regard I would have would be concerns about whether there'll be a problem for my neighbors. Um, of course, in situations where we're worried about the volume of our birds, it's very likely that we're not going to have a rooster anyway. But it is worth mentioning that chicken hens do sing a little egg song when they lay their eggs. And when I say a song, it's, it's actually much more of a squawk. We're kind of being poetic when we say egg song. Um, but it's not, I don't want to give the impression that hens are silent just because we've said that roosters are noisy. Um, so it wouldn't be so much proximity to the fence, it would be what's on the other side of the fence. If your neighbor's bedroom window is on the other side of the fence, you don't want to be pushing your boundaries too much in that regard. Even though we are allowed to have hens in, for example, the city of Dallas, um, we're not allowed to create a nuisance noise issue, even with the things we're allowed to have. Some people run into that with dogs, for example. We're all allowed to have a dog, but too much barking will get code compliance telling you you have a problem. Um, so think about that egg song, even with hens and proximity to your neighbors. That's a good point. And depending on where you live, some cities even regulate like how far away 
your coops are from your property line. I think just because of what you mentioned that you don't want it next to the bedroom of your neighbor or something like that. So Absolutely. yeah, just, just little, make sure you check that wherever you're living. A little bit of homework on code compliance with all of these topics makes all kinds of sense. Um, my, my goal with this presentation was not to imply that everyone could keep all four of these types of birds. It was a hope that everyone could find a way to feasibly keep at least one of these types of birds in their living situation. That's a good point because I, I am just enamored with the fact that you have all of the birds and your dogs all basically living in this condo together. So that, <laughs> this commune that they're all living together, that's pretty awesome. Absolutely. Okay. So, um, so with regard, so we had a question about chickens and clipping their wings. So do you recommend wing clipping if you have a four foot fence or even an eight foot fence? Um, my tendency would be not to try and clip wings unless I've run into previous problems with the birds going over the fence. I hate to recommend waiting for problems before we talk solutions. And at the same time, predator issues become much more of a concern if you take away your bird's ability to get away from things. Um, chickens are not great at flying. Uh, some One of my bantams I've seen go as far as making it to the roof of the house. Um, other than that, it's mostly what I talked about with the ducks. They fly pretty well going downhill for a short distance. Um, I would take that, in, that concern into account when I pick my breeds maybe go with a larger bodied breed for the sake of worrying less about their flying. Um, but I have not clipped any wings and I would generally advocate against it unless you've run into problems that really say you need to. Okay, good point. All right, so this is our, uh, th this is our last question because everybody wants to see you feed the kitchen. Okay, so uh, can you go over some tips for winterizing? You know, cause we just had this experience last week so for example, like what can you use to winterize such as like insulation, foam, burlap, fiberglass? I mean, you know, what, what can you do if you find yourself, you know, all of a sudden in the middle of the winter storm? Absolutely. Um, and I have to admit, I, I did kind of breeze over that because it was a last minute add in to this presentation. Uh, last week I was struggling with our main struggle during this cold spell, which was keeping the birds watered. Um, they can't drink ice. And the biggest struggle we had with winterizing was keeping water from freezing for them. Um, but I did kind of breeze by it. I pointed out we put corrugated uh, plastic up on the walls of the run. Um, there was no insulation value to speak of there at all. It was just shelter from the moisture and shelter from cold drafts coming into them. Um, in terms of insulation, you could do any of those things and it wouldn't really have any downside. But I would focus more on bedding material for warmth insulation value. Um, lots of fresh straw, not hay. Hay is a lot more moisture content than straw. A lot of people think those are the same thing. Um, in our case, we actually had trouble finding straw right before the cold spell hit. Everybody knew they needed it. Um, so we just went with cedar bedding, uh, but piled it in about twice as thick as usual. We've usually got maybe two inches on the bottom. We piled it up to about five, six inches tall for the cold spell. Um, the chickens, when they got too cold, I saw more of them bedded down on the floor instead of roosting. Uh, the ducks definitely cuddled together a little bit more than usual. Pigeons didn't seem to care at all. They're still sitting on their shelves, a couple of them even sitting up next to the window in the draftiest spot they could find. Um, I will mention the livestock guardian dogs thought it was the best weather we've ever had, and I kept trying to get them to come in to warm up, and they looked at me like they were being punished. Um, but generally speaking, it's just a matter of keeping moisture and draftiness out of the situation. Extreme temperatures can lead to frostbite, things like that. But one thing I learned from beekeeping is that we read on the internet about extreme temperatures. And as far as cold goes, none of it ever applies to Texas. And even with the extreme temperatures we just had, very little of the talk about cold weather that you see online really applies to Texas. You see people talking about their chickens in negative 30 degrees up north, and we're just never going to get there. Um, we did very little in terms of insulation. It was all about keeping drafts and moisture out of their shelter space. All right. And um, we also, uh, Debbie, wanted to thank you. She said she's seen you speak before and that you're always a great speaker and educator. And, uh, and so she wanted to thank you for your time. And I think the rest of us are ready for you to stop sharing so we can see the pigeon. Okay, wonderful. I'm gonna have to step away from the camera for half a second to go grab it. I'll be back in about 30 seconds, not half a second. That was fiction. <laughs>
All right, and, and if anybody has any other questions for Ryan, please take this uh, opportunity to put them into the chat uh, so that he can answer those. And also our next uh, Grow With Us presentation will be on March 1st, and it's about garden design with a um, Austin area master gardener, and that was gonna be a really good one. All right, I was reminded of one thing as I went to grab this baby pigeon, and that is that my lack of concern for temperatures extends to adult birds, but not to baby birds. We do have climate controlled space for the young ones. Um, and this is our newest little bottle baby pigeon. Uh, since our previous pigeon was named Tiny, this one is named Itty. Uh, this is a giant runt pigeon that we're looking at here, just not very giant yet. Uh, and when I'm bottle feeding baby pigeons, I do use parrot formula that you can buy at the pet store. Um, it's not quite the perfect answer for them, and therefore I sometimes blend in a little bit of dust from my chicken crumble uh, from the starter, starter feed. Um, but for the most part, at a young age, they're eating pigeon, uh, parrot formula. I'm using a small bottle. Uh, it's a repurposed bottle. I'm not plugging that product, and it's not what I'm feeding here. Um, I'm using a finger cot uh, or a glove to a uh, finger to a rubber glove would work just fine to provide sort of a valve at the end. Uh, they reach into their parents' mouth for food in a natural setting. And here I'm sort of providing a guide into the mouth of the bottle. We got to get that beak in there. And hopefully you can see clearly. I'm trying not to drip on my keyboard here, um, but we can see him start guzzling that formula down. And we can literally see the crop start to fill up right here. Um, as I start to see tension in that crop, I wanna stop feeding. We could overfeed and cause problems by filling that crop too tightly. Um, a parent pigeon would never be a bottomless source of formula like my bottle could potentially be. So as that starts to fill up, and you can probably actually see it in the video, we will gradually start to slow this down. I'm gonna let him get a little bit more down first. Um, generally, when he sort of misses the bottle for the first time, I start to think maybe we're done. And uh, that's probably going to be the case here. So there we have Itty the Pigeon. And they do make a mess. After I feed, I will try to clean up some of the formula that gets all over them. And about once a week, we'll do a little sort of towel bath, rag bath with warm water and clean off anything that's caked on and can't quite go away. Uh, but the shape of the beak on a pigeon literally helps with what we're doing here because it has a wide spot. So you can kind of pop that wide spot on the beak through the plastic you're using to cover the bottle, uh, having already made a small slit, of course, and get a little bit of a seal there up until the point where they pull back and say they've had enough. Um, so hopefully that's um, not as hideous looking as some may think it is. Uh, I, I guess I think ugly is cute, but we've had a lot of fun trying to raise these little bottle baby pigeons. Not the recommended way to raise a pigeon. Ideally, the parents would do a better job of this than we could ever hope to, uh, but it sure has been fun trying to save a few when, when the need arose. So hopefully we saw some cuteness factor there. I, I, think, we, I think we all did, and I didn't realize how big his bill was going to be. Uh, and and uh, So how big will he eventually get? Um, the giant runts will get to the size of a small chicken. Um, if I'm measuring beak to tail, we're looking about like that. They're pretty sizable birds. I uh, think if I saw a pigeon like that come, you know, walking up to me in a parking lot, I'd give it whatever candy bar I had or whatever it was. <laughs> right. Compared to the average parking lot pigeon, I would, I would say they're about double size on some of the larger utility breeds. All right. And, um, we also had, okay, so we have uh, one of our viewers, Sparkle. She had, or, or, or they have no experience at all, but they have a lot of desire. Where would you suggest that they get started raising poultry? Um, get started in terms of additional information and education stuff. Um, I definitely recommend reaching out to people around you. Um, the internet is a blessing and a curse for these things, especially social media. Um, there's a lot of information out there. There's also a lot of people that are still figuring things out and sharing what they learn along the way. And with that comes some bad advice sometimes. Um, so I would encourage not looking at any one source of information, but instead evaluating everything available to you and taking it all with a grain of salt and putting some additional weight on whatever you hear the most, perhaps. 
Um, there are lots of good books on this, and I probably should have had a slide that recommended some of them. Um, certainly, I'm willing to make myself available for any additional information as well. Um, we have every desire to be doing additional education work on our property here. Uh, when we first moved in, I got to do a series of beekeeping classes out here in the hive, stuff like that. We want to be doing stuff like that with poultry as well. Um, but we do have a baby on the way right now, a pregnancy to worry about. And as a result, we're being extra conservative about COVID concerns right now. So we haven't had a whole lot of that kind of stuff going on in person this year, instead of favoring doing digital stuff. Um, in terms of places to get birds, I definitely recommend going local. Uh, it's not even an option to ship birds right now after the cold weather and some postal issues lately. So many birds were arriving dead that um, the postal service has temporarily stopped shipping birds. Um, look for good local sources, people you can get birds from that you can trust. Um, I will plug that we do sell birds as well. Uh, we don't publicly have birds for sale, quote unquote, but uh, contact us and we do make private arrangements for ducklings, chicks, quail, um, and potentially even pigeons. Absolutely. And there's also, if you are on Facebook, there are uh, backyard chicken groups, like specifically a Dallas backyard chicken group that you can join. And uh, they are there to support you. So you can ask your questions and get answers and different things like that. And they also share different kinds of resources and places where you can find birds and, and stuff like that. And also normally um, there is a annual coop tour in Dallas. Yes, wonderful event. A chance to go just see in person what everybody else is doing to accommodate their birds. And you'll see all different scales and different sides of the spectrum in that sense. Um, it really does a good job of emphasizing that anybody can find some workable way to do some of these things. Uh, I highly recommend the Coop Tour if you haven't done it before. All right, so I'm not exactly sure what time of year, I think it was in the spring or something, and I don't know what it'll look like this year, but um, uh, it, it, that is, it'll be publicized on social media, and especially if you join some of those backyard chicken groups, um, because they will also ask, they'll also invite people to, sh to be on the tour. And then, um, and also for everybody who registered for this uh, session in advance, uh, Vanessa will send out a list of books from the Dallas, that the Dallas Public Library has available on raising chickens, uh, or, or fowl, I should say, uh, that are available for checkout from, for curbside pickup at the different library branches. And so lastly, Ryan, um, if, if I wanted mm -hmm. to start, you know, with, with some poultry, what do you think is, I saw, I, I know you saw, you gave us, you know, your recommendations on like, you know, the pet factor and the meat factor and the eggs and stuff like that. But what do you think is the most accessible for, for someone to start off with? I, I would say the, the basic comparison that we made to chickens was made for a reason. They are probably um, the, the ideal stepping stone into all these things. Um, in a lot of ways, chickens would be the answer. Probably the only exception I would make to that is if space, lim if space limitations are a major factor, then I might lean towards quail just a little bit. Um, a quail cage can take a very minimal footprint. As I mentioned, it could even be feasible in a garage setting rather than in a backyard. Um, if space concerns are a main factor for you, I'd consider quail. Otherwise, the answer would be chickens for sure. All right. Okay. And also, uh, Sp Sparkle, want to congratulate you on your your, your child, your, your, uh, your upcoming baby. And we wanna thank, thank you so you. much for sharing your, your knowledge and uh, in, in with in your great presentation with us today. We're excited that we were the first to have you uh, talk to us about different kinds of poultry. Uh, and so with that, Ryan, uh, also Ryan's email is in the chat. If you wanna reach out to him, please do. And on behalf of the Dallas Public Library, Seed Library and Dallas Environmental Quality, and sustainability. We thank you for joining us with today's Grow With Us session. This will be recorded and live on the Dallas Public Library's YouTube page, so you can reference it and share it. And of course, if you did um, register, you will get an email in a few days with access to this recording and uh, other resources such as books available from the Dallas Public Library. And with that, thank you all so very much. Thank you so much for having me.